my name's Dan, this is Cora, and we're here to tell you how to play the game we designed... Cora Quest. Cora Quest. So, Cora Quest is a cooperative game. What, what's a cooperative game, Cora? Well, it's basically just not a competitive game, where instead of trying to beat each other and going in different teams or whatever, you're all working together to like go to the same goal, kind of. That's right, so you're going to win the game together or lose the game together. Yeah. Um, you're all on the same team and you're playing against the board. And in Cora Quest, you're going to be going through a, a, an adventure in a dungeon and trying to trying to either rescue somebody or find something or or pay for lots of there's there's loads of different quests. No spoilers, Dad. No spoilers. No spoilers. So now this video is a how to play video. Um, we don't really suggest that everybody has to watch this video or anything like that, but because because you can really you can pick up Cora Quest as you go along, can't you? You can certainly yeah. teach it as you go along. But this is maybe for the person who's teaching everybody else the rest of the rules. Yeah. yeah. So, without further ado, let's get on to the video. Setting up. First of all, we need to pick a quest from the Book of Quests. For your first game, we always recommend you start with Fangs for the Memory. As you play Cora Quest, you're going to grow the dungeon as the game goes on by drawing dungeon cards and putting them down on the table. Every now and again, you're going to draw a special story dungeon card. And when that happens, you're going to stop and read a bit of the text from the quest book. You can tell the difference between story dungeon cards and regular dungeon cards in a few ways. Story cards have letters in their corners rather than numbers. They also usually have more illustrations on them. And each one has a scroll drawn somewhere on it too. So, to play Fangs for the Memory, we need to find out which story dungeon cards we're going to be using in this adventure. So, we look at this orange box at the top of the quest, and it tells us we're going to be using story cards A, B, C and D. We find those cards, and we put them to one side just for now. Now, we need to sort out the basic dungeon cards. These are the ones with numbers in the corner. Today we're going to be playing a normal length game, so we need to use the normal length game card. So that's cards numbered 2 to 13. We're going to shuffle these cards up and then deal them out into four different piles. Now we're going to take those four story dungeon cards we put aside just now and add one to the top of each of the four piles. Then we're going to shuffle each of the four piles separately. Finally, we're going to put these four piles together, but it has to be in a particular way to make sure the story is told in the right order. To do that, we look at this orange box at the start of the quest again, and we can see that the pile that has got story card D in it goes at the bottom of the deck, and then goes story card C, then B, and then finally on top is story card A. Now the dungeon deck's ready. We just need to place the explore marker on top of it and we'll explain why we need to do that in a little while. You might be wondering what happened to the basic dungeon card, numbered 1. Well, that's going to be our starting dungeon card where all the heroes enter the dungeon. So, we're going to put that down ready on the table, like this. So now the dungeon is ready, we need to know what enemies we're going to be facing. To do that, we go back to the orange box at the start of the quest. So it looks like we'll need some orcs, some goblins, some gremlins, some spiders, and a giant snake. So we just need to find those enemy cards, and also their standees, and then put them out ready. Let's have a look at one of the enemy cards. This is a card for the goblins. And on the card, you can see how much health the goblins have, how fast they can move, how many dice they roll when they make an attack, and what range their attacks have. Also, up here is a symbol that we're going to use to find out when they'll spawn in the dungeon. We're going to go into a bit more detail about all these things later in the video. All the enemies have two sides to the cards, the normal side and the tough side. This is the way that you can adjust the difficulty of the game. For a starting game, we very much recommend that you put them on their normal sides. So now we have some enemies, but what about the heroes? Every game of Cora Quest uses four heroes in it, no matter how many players there are. You just split the heroes up between you however you want. So for example, if there's just two people playing, then you could control two heroes each. In this game, we're going to be playing with the Dwarf, the Halfling, the Wizard Woman and Sword Girl. So first, we need to get their cards and put them in front of us. Here's Sword Girl's card, for example. Now let's have a look at this card. Just like with the enemy cards, you can see how much health she has, what her speed is, and what dice she uses to attack with. One red dice plus her weapon. 
You can also see her special ability and what starting item she begins the game with. Heroes also have two sides to their card. This time it's a normal side and a determined side. If a hero ever misses with an attack, it flips from its normal side to its determined side. And this means they're more likely to hit next time. Once they do hit, then they flip back to their normal side. And we're going to talk a little bit more about attacking and becoming determined later in this video. So now we've chosen our heroes, let's get their starting equipment. Sword Girl starts with a broadsword, so we can put that card down next to her. You can see here that it adds one white dice to her attacks, and it's got a range of one. As well as their equipment, each hero gets a health dial. So, take one of those and set it to that hero's health as shown on the card. Sword Girl's got a health of eight. Now we take the four hero standees and we put them down on empty squares on the starting dungeon card. And they're all ready to go on an adventure. We now need to set up the countdown track. This is used in two ways. Firstly, to keep track of the hero's special abilities. And secondly, to encourage the players to keep the game moving by keeping exploring new parts of the dungeon. We'll explain how it does this a bit later. However, for now, just put the countdown card that goes up to two on the table. Put the threat marker on level two and put each hero's countdown tokens next to the track somewhere. And finally, let's shuffle the treasure deck and put it on the table. We'll put the special item deck next to them too. And then we're going to put out all the tokens that we might need during the game. And now we're ready to play Korra Quest. Starting the quest. The first thing we do when starting an adventure is read out the introduction. This sets the scene for the quest and tells us why the heroes are going down into the dark dungeon. You can read the text out loud yourself, or if you want to, you can use the recording of my dad reading it that you can find on the CoraQuest.com website. Next, you check to see what the win and lose conditions are for the game. To do that, you go back to that orange box at the start of the quest. In Fangs of the Memory, it says that we win the game if the heroes defeat the giant snake and we lose the game if any of the heroes are defeated. There are no special extra rules for this quest, so we can just get started. Core Quest Rounds A game of Core Quest takes place over a number of rounds. Each round is split up into three phases, and you play through these in order. First is the hero phase, where the heroes run around exploring the dungeon, opening treasure chests and fighting monsters. Then there's the enemy phase, where monsters get to fight the heroes back. And then there's a the countdown phase, where we keep track of the hero's special abilities and see what the threat level is, and if a swarm of scary spiders are going to leave their web and sweep through the dungeon. Once the round is over, a new round starts again, with a new hero phase, and you keep playing round after round until you have either won or lost the adventure. The hero phase. Every hero gets one turn each in the hero phase. It's up to the players which order those turns are taken in. You don't have to go clockwise around the table or anything like that. You can't split turns up though, so each hero must take their full turn before the next one can go. On their turn, a hero can do up to two full actions. They can also do as many free actions as they want to, and can even interrupt a full action with a free action if they like. We'll go into each of these in more detail. However, here's a quick summary of what actions are available to you. Free actions. Reveal dungeon. Exploring the dungeon and seeing what's around the next corner. Use item. Using a magical item or potion. Full actions. Move. Move around in the dungeon. Search. Open treasure chests and see if there's any treasure in there. Swap. Swap treasure and weapons between yourself and other heroes. Revive. Wake up stunned heroes. We aren't going to talk about this in this video, as you only do this in just one of the quests. However, the rules are in the rulebook when you need them. Attack. Fighting enemies. So here are those actions in more detail. Reveal dungeon. This is what you're going to be using a lot to explore the dungeon and find all the different rooms. To reveal a new part of the dungeon, the hero must first be standing right next to the edge of the dungeon. They then take the top card off the dungeon deck, and if the explorer mark is still on top as well, then you take that off and put it down next to you. Now this is so you can remember in the countdown phase if you did explore the dungeon this round, because it's easy to forget. 
So now you put the new dungeon card down next to your hero in the dungeon. You're allowed to turn it around and put it down however you want, but the card must be directly in line with all the other cards in the dungeon. And also, at least one floor square must join onto the card that the hero is standing on. For example, this isn't allowed as the cards don't line up, and this isn't allowed because the floors don't join up. If there are any of these enemy symbols on the new card, then you spawn an enemy on each one. To tell what kind of enemy you spawn, match the symbol on the dungeon card to the symbol on the enemy cards. So for example, we put a goblin in this spot and two gremlins in these spots. If there are any treasure chests on the new card, then you put a treasure chest token on it as well. Story dungeon cards. Sometimes a card that comes out will be one of the special story dungeon cards that we seeded in the deck during the setup. When one of these story cards come out, then you look at what letters in its corner, then you find the corresponding entry in the quest that you're playing. Then you read out its story and carry out any special instructions there are. So for example, this is story card A in Fangs for the Memory. On this occasion, we're going to be using the CoraQuest.com website to read the story part out to us. Story Card A You find an abandoned gnome-sized backpack on the floor, and you recognise it as belonging to Annabelle. In the backpack are three books, A Spotter's Guide to Vipers by Sir Pent, Reptile Keeping for Fun and Profit by William Snakespear, and Cobra Catching by David Hisselhoff. There's also a bottle of liquid labelled in case of snake bites. What brilliant acting there. So, after you've heard that bit of the story, then you also do any instructions that are written underneath it. So in this example, the hero who uncovered card A takes the antidote card from the special item deck. Use item. The other free action you can do is use an item. In your adventures, you sometimes pick up magic items and potions that have effects on them. You can do these effects as a free action, unless the card says otherwise. Full actions. So now we're going to move on to the full actions. These are the ones that a hero can only do two of each turn. And when they finish them, then that's their turn over. You're allowed to do two different full actions, like move and attack for example. Or you can do the same full action twice, like attack and then attack again. Here are the full actions available to you. Move. A hero can move as many squares as the speed that's listed on the card. So for example, Wizard Woman can move four squares. You can move side to side, up and down, and diagonally. You can move through a space that's occupied by another hero, but you can't end your move on the same space as another hero. You can't move through any spaces that are occupied by enemies as they won't let you through. You also can't move through walls, but all the other images on a dungeon card, like the treasure chest for example, don't affect movement at all. Search. If your hero is standing next to, or on top of a treasure chest token, they can search it for treasure. To do this, first remove the token, then take the top card of the treasure deck and see what you find. Be careful though, because there's some traps in there, as well as treasure. Each treasure chest can only be searched one time. Swap item. If a hero is standing next to another hero, then they can use a full action to swap any number of items with that hero. The swaps don't have to be equal, and one of the heroes can swap nothing at all, providing all the players agree to it. Attack. The dungeon is full of monsters and creatures and enemies, and sometimes you're going to need to fight them. The first step in fighting an enemy is to check that you're in range and line of sight. Now I'll explain how you do that in a minute, however, once you've checked all that, you need to roll some dice to see if you hit your target. You find the dice you're going to be rolling by adding the ones shown on your character card to the ones on your weapon card. So, for example, Sword Girl has got one red dice from her character card and one white dice from her sword. So, I'm going to be rolling two dice, one red and one white. Every hit symbol you roll counts as one damage to your target. Each different type of enemy can take different amounts of damage before they're defeated. So, for example, this gremlin is defeated after only one damage. So I take its standee off the board, and it's going to take no further part in the battle. This orc, on the other hand, can take three damage. So even if we roll two hits, 
it's still going to be standing at the end of our action. So, in order to show how much damage it has taken, we put two of these damage tokens under its standee. Hopefully we're going to hit it for one more damage soon and finish it off. Range and Line of Sight As I said before, you can only hit an enemy if you're in range and line of sight. Now, a lot of the time you won't even need to think about this, as if your hero is standing directly next to an enemy, then they're always within range and line of sight, and so you can always hit them. However, some weapons, such as crossbows and the catapult, have the ability to hit targets that are a bit further away. So, to check if an enemy's in range, you look at the range number on the bottom right-hand corner of your weapon card. For example, this catapult has a range of 4, so it can hit enemies standing up to 4 squares away. Now, to check if a target's in line of sight, we need to make sure that our hero doesn't have anything blocking their view. To do that, we draw an imaginary line from any corner of the hero's square to any corner of the target's square. If we can do that without going through or along the side of a square that's occupied by either a wall or another character, then we can hit the target. If the imaginary line does go through or along the side of an occupied square, however, we don't have line of sight, and so we can't hit it. So, for example, the halfling doesn't have line of sight to the orc because the imaginary line is blocked by the wall. The halfling also doesn't have line of sight to the goblin because the imaginary line runs up the side of Wizard Woman's square, so she's blocking their view. The halfling does have line of sight on the gremlin, however, and so they're probably going to shoot at them this turn. Becoming determined. Whenever you roll your attack dice and miss, your hero gets very frustrated with themselves and becomes determined. This means we flip their hero card over to the determined side. A determined hero will roll more dice on the next attack. So in this case, the dwarf misses an attack on the goblin, and so flips his card, and now rolls three dice. A red and a white from his card, and then the white dice from his axe. As soon as a determined hero rolls a hit, they then flip back to the normal side. Special Abilities Every hero has a unique special ability written on their hero card. Using these abilities does not take up an action, unless it says otherwise on their card. After you use a hero's special ability, then you take that hero's countdown token and place it on the number 2 space on the countdown track. Now, this token is going to move down and eventually off the track in the countdown phase, but while the hero's token is on the countdown track, you are not allowed to use that hero's special ability again. That's all the actions available to the heroes. And once every hero's done their turn and taken their two full actions, then it's time to move on to the enemy phase. If Core Quest was a computer game, then the computer game would control all the enemies. But as it's a board game, then the players are going to have to physically move them around and roll their dice for them. However, there are some rules that will tell you how they relax. In the enemy phase, each enemy in the dungeon is going to take a turn to do two actions. The players can choose which order the enemies go, but all the enemies must do a full turn. Now, the actions available for the enemies to do are much less in number than the ones available to the heroes. Basically, the enemies can attack and they can move. An enemy will always attack a hero if it's able to. It's going to attack the closest hero, and if there's a draw, the players get to decide which of those two close heroes it attacks. And the enemies attack in exactly the same way that the heroes do. The dice they use and the range of their attacks are printed on the enemy cards. This goblin, for example, uses two white dice to attack and has got a range of one. The only thing different between enemies and heroes attacking is that enemies can never become determined, even if they miss. If the attack is successful, then the hero being attacked takes damage. And you record that damage by turning the hero's damage dial to the right number. If your hero's health ever reaches zero, then they're defeated and everybody loses the game. So try and make sure that doesn't happen. If an enemy is not able to attack, so if it hasn't got range and or line of sight to a hero, then it will use one of its actions to move towards the closest hero until it is able to attack. You can find out how many squares an enemy moves by looking at its card. Just like with heroes, an enemy can use its two actions to do the same thing twice. Like attack, then attack again, for example. Once the last enemy has taken its turn, then it's time for the final phase of the round, the countdown phase. 
The first thing we do in the countdown phase is move all the hero countdown tokens on the track down one space. If any hero's countdown token comes off the bottom of the track, like this, they are now able to use their special ability again. Then, the next thing we do is check if the threat token moves. If you haven't explored the dungeon this round, then the explore marker will still be on the top of the dungeon deck. If it is, then you move the threat token down one level on the countdown track. If the threat token ever comes off the bottom of the countdown track, then you're in trouble, because a bunch of spiders is going to appear in the dungeon. When this happens, you put a spider token in the middle of every dungeon card that has a spider web on it. These spiders will act as normal enemies in the next enemy phase, and have their own enemy card. Once you've spawned those spiders, then you put the threat token back on level 2 of the countdown track. This threat of spiders coming to the dungeon if you don't explore it fast enough encourages the heroes to keep going and keep the game flowing and stops them dilly-dallying. The last thing to do in the countdown phase is to make sure the explore marker is back on top of the dungeon deck and then you can start the hero phase of the next round. So then, as Cora said, you just go round after round, keep on playing each round through the hero phase, the enemy phase and the countdown phase until you've met the win conditions or met the lose conditions, and then, then the game's over. So there you go, that's how to play Core Quest. If you've got any questions or anything like that, make sure to let us know. Email us at info at corequest.com. Yep. And then um, that's all we've got to say, isn't it? So thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>